This uh, lecture, lecture number 32, is a relatively short uh, uh, piece. I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the relationship uh, between uh, obesity and uh, uh, hunger, and you know some of the some of the work that's been done, both um, basic research uh, as well as uh, clinically based uh, research, because this is a a very important topic. So um, again, relatively short, but I, I wanted to separate this from some of the other things that we've talked about in this area of motivation. Uh, you know, there's a lot of health risks that are associated with obesity. I think that most of us are familiar with these things. Um, certainly uh, hypertension, cancer, uh, various disease states like uh, gallbladder disease, and um, uh, kidney uh, failure, stroke, heart failure. Um, these are all uh, health risks that are associated with obesity. And um, uh, so it's really important that we know a little bit uh, about it, a little bit about it from the perspective of what uh, psychology has to say. Um, one of the chief questions here, um, like so many other areas uh, that we've studied in psychology, is this whole nature nurture question, you know, and how much uh, can we say that uh, obesity, uh, for example, is related to uh, genetics? Um, we haven't identified uh, a single gene um, uh, that kind of a, a genetic influence has not been established. It's it's probably uh, the contribution of many different genes uh, that leads uh, in part to uh, obesity, but there is work uh, that has been done with twins, um, uh, concordance research. Uh, monozygotic twins are very similar to um, uh, each other uh, in comparison to dizygotic twins in the, the primary factors that contribute to obesity. Uh, and certainly one of those factors is how much stomach distension um, uh, influences uh, the ending of eating. And again, there's very strong relationship there. Uh, concordance rates in terms of monozygotics, um, uh, much more so uh, than what we would see in dizygotics. And, um, you know, the, the influence of taste, um, uh, again, uh, very high concordance rates when, when you take a look at uh, uh, various taste factors. Uh, monozygotic twins resemble each other uh, uh, much more so. Uh, than do dizygotics in um, the influence that taste plays in, in contributing to obesity. Um, when you uh, factor in the other part of this, you know, environmental influences, uh, there's some wonderful work uh, that has been done with um, uh, various uh, Native uh, Americans, the uh, uh, Pimas of Arizona. Uh, and Mexico in particular, where they've taken a look at dietary changes that have occurred. And one of the things that we know about these populations of Native Americans is that historically they ate plants. Um, but uh, once their diet changed uh, to a more typical American diet, uh, many became um, uh, overweight when, uh, in fact, uh, uh, when they were on um, uh, the kind of diets, uh, eating of plants that they were on for a very long period of time, uh, there was little, if any, um, uh, obesity. So this certainly indicates the important interactive factors that are involved um, uh, with the environment. Uh, lifestyle certainly plays uh, a very prominent role. One of the things that we know is that um, uh, beginning in the 1970s, there was a very sharp increase uh, that was taking place uh, here in this country uh, uh, in terms of uh, obesity. What, did it, what was it related to? Well, sedentary lifestyle, uh, for sure. Um, uh, Americans uh, are not anywhere near as active uh, as they used to be. Um, the availability of, of fast food, uh, which has become very uh, pervasive. Um, portion sizes um, also have played a role, uh, much larger portion sizes now in your typical uh, uh, restaurant, American restaurant. And uh, another factor, um, uh, the use of fructose uh, in foods uh, has certainly also played a, a very prominent role. 
so indeed, um, these are different factors, lifestyle factors that certainly have contributed to the rise in obesity that, is, that has occurred in this country. And in, I should also say, in other countries uh, where um, uh, American uh, diet, uh, American foods, uh, are now being consumed at a much higher level uh, than they were at, at one time. Things like McDonald's hamburgers, for example, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, so you're seeing that pattern um, that we uh, have observed here in the United States play out in other countries where um, the American diet uh, has been introduced to those countries. Um, one of the biggest problems is that of childhood obesity. Um, that rate has, has virtually tripled uh, since the 1970s, nearly one in five school age children uh, uh, in the United States are, are uh, classified, uh, medically classified as, as being obese, you know, 20%. I mean, that, that is a, really a, a staggering uh, number. Um, the weight loss industry uh, here in this country, as well as other countries, um, billions of dollars are spent by people every year who get involved with these, um, in some cases, very um, uh, shady um, uh, um, uh, enterprises. Um, uh, a lot of this is by uh, consumers uh, that simply are not very critical about making uh, choices uh, in terms of um, uh, what kinds of weight loss uh, programs to get involved with. Um, don't get me wrong, some weight loss uh, programs uh, like Weight Watchers, for example, um, are, are excellent. Um, but uh, some weight loss companies are sadly what we would have to call uh, predatory. Uh, that is to say they're, they're out to make money, get people hooked into programs, uh, and then um, um, uh, you know continue to charge them as people fall out of these programs. You know they sign up for let's say a year, so they're obligated to that, but yet they fall out of the program after just a few weeks. Um, so I think that they are uh, many of them are uh, predatory and make a lot of false uh, promises. There's two proven ways to weight loss. It's really quite simple. Exercise more and eat less. Um, those are the two factors uh, that are really uh, the key ones in terms of, uh, of weight loss. Um, you know, there are certainly other weight loss strategies. Certainly there are certain types of drugs like uh, fenfluramine and uh, fentamine. Um, they uh, uh, block the reuptake of certain neurotransmitters that ordinarily are involved um, in becoming active after we complete a meal. Uh, and um, uh, they uh, uh, serve as, uh, as I noted, uh, appetite suppressants. Another drug, Orlistat, or Orlistat, excuse me, Orlistat uh, that prevents the intestines from absorbing fats. Uh, so again, these are, you know, some drug-related um, strategies that sometimes are used, um, uh, not on a wide scale, but with, with some individuals. Um, there's also bariatric surgery. Um, the other words for it are ga simply gastric bypass. Uh, and if you take a look at the stomach uh, before surgery, uh, you can see that the uh, food ordinarily is, uh, is going to the stomach and then passing through the duodenum uh, and then ultimately to the small intestine. Um, after bariatric surgery, um, the stomach is smaller, uh, and this bypass that you see here, um, uh, in which you're you're uh, going past the the duodenum, um, what is happening is uh, you feel full with a lot less food, and the food that you eat again no longer goes through some parts of your stomach like the duodenum, for example, uh, that ordinarily is involved in absorbing food. Um, so again, gastric bypass, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a minute or two, but uh, certainly this is uh, one technique for, for trying to achieve uh, weight loss. 
Certainly another one is uh, what we call adjustable gastric bands, like uh, what you see here, which can be tightened or, or loosened. Uh, this is an inflatable band, and this goes around the upper part of the stomach, uh, and it cr creates a small pouch, like uh, what you see right here. Um, and what this does is it slows down, uh, it limits uh, the amount of food uh, that can be consumed at one time, so it gives the uh, the sense really uh, of being full. Uh, so again, this is another um, um, uh, bariatric surgical procedure uh, that can be used. Um, there are a lot of problems uh, with uh, bariatric surgery. Uh, 10 to 20 percent of individuals have very serious side effects. There can be infections that are associated with it, bowel obstructions, leakage of food. Uh, nutritional deficiencies. Um, it's not something that necessarily improves survival. Um, and again, individuals who do make that decision, it has to be done in a very careful, deliberate manner uh, with um, uh, a, a physician uh, and experts uh, uh, that are in this area. Uh, it, it is um, something that is worth considering, uh, but really only in very, very severe cases of obesity, and it's a last resort uh, kind of measure. Um, so again, I wanted to talk a little bit about obesity. We've done that here, uh, and I think some you know important things uh, uh, to keep in mind uh, on this topic.